This story has been recorded at an Addictive Eaters Anonymous meeting in New Zealand. You can email us at contact at aeanz.org. First Friday of the month, um, it is a speaker meeting, and um, tonight we're going to welcome Leila. Thanks, Carla. My name's Leila, I'm addicted to food. Hello. It's good to be here. Um, my heart's going a bit like the clappers, so I'll just make a start. Um, yeah, I... Where do I start? Um, I... My story started in England. I um, grew up in Somerset, and I was the youngest of three girls, and my parents were teachers. And in our house, um, food was always readily available. You know, my parents didn't have restrictions like I've heard of some people talk about here. Um, the idea was that, um, you know, it was just available and you'd eat, and if you had enough, you'd stop. Um, so that was great for me. And yeah, I don't remember when I was a very young child, but um, from when I remember, I absolutely loved food. And um, my, when I was about eight years old, my mum bundled us in a car and said we were going swimming. And I didn't know what was going on, and it turned out we were running away from my dad. Um, he'd been violent for much of my life, and I never knew. And I remember sitting in the car and feeling terrified, and then later on thinking it was all my fault. And then thinking, they should have told me, you know, and um, just so very clearly it all being about me. And yeah, you know, that feeling continued for many years. And that fear for me continued for many years. And um, yeah, I always thought it was about that, but I have learned since that other people have gone through trauma and they didn't do the things I did. So yeah. Um, so. What happened? So for me, I yeah, I was always interested in food and I wanted to eat. Um, and yeah, when I went to birthday parties and things, I was always interested in the food and I would try and make birthday parties about the food and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we were all kind of like that in my family, so I don't remember thinking, this is weird or anything. Um, the first time I think I probably noticed something different was when I was, I think about 12, and I went to a wedding, and we were wearing these handmade dresses, and one of our relatives said I look quite fat, and um, I was absolutely mortified, you know, I was just like, oh my god, you know, I never thought of myself like that, and, um, you know, then I was, you know, more aware. Um, Sorry, I get quite nervous with public speaking, so there might be a few pauses. Um, yeah, so... So, yeah, um... I... Yeah, the ironic thing is that I actually used to want to be an actor. You wouldn't believe it now, because it's gone the other way. But, um, you know, all that bravado came from my addiction, I realise now. Um, you know, for me, the food turned into alcohol, and, um, you know, for me, sex was a big problem as well. It actually came before alcohol, um, from about the age of 12. And um, for me, it was just more of that wanting to fit in, wanting to find a place in the world, um, which I, I know now comes, you know, from the addiction. And, um, you know, I just couldn't stop. I was incredibly promiscuous and found myself walking home in the middle of the night from strangers' houses all the time and, um, you know, feeling absolutely rotten and dirty and horrible, but I just still couldn't stop doing it. And, um, yeah, when I was probably about 13 or something, I started drinking. And that was great because when I was drinking, I would throw up and all the food was gone. Not long after that, I started taking drugs and started with marijuana and ecstasy pills and speed. 
And for me, I absolutely loved it because it took me out of the world. You know, I really loved things that would take me away. And um, I used to be very good at English um, because I would write these really long stories, these sort of stories about the world. And I would take myself off in a corner away from all the other kids and write these stories. And I absolutely loved it. You know, I didn't want to talk to anyone, you know, just no one come near me. Um, but yeah, when I went to secondary school, I was doing that still. And I remember I wrote this one story actually about my family life. And it was probably the first real thing I'd ever written. And I wrote this story all about violence and feeling terrified every time I left the house and all of that stuff. And I got this award for it. And then one of my friends was a bit jealous, I think, and said some stuff. And I was like, right, I'm not going not gonna to bother anymore, you know, because I just wanted to be liked. I always wanted to be liked by everyone. And um, so, you know, the alcohol came quite quickly after that. And, you know, I wasn't concentrating at school. And, um, yeah, I just wanted to fit in. So I was drinking all the time, going away from school, um, writing notes, forging notes from my mum, saying that I was sick. Um, smoking, smoking like absolutely loads, just couldn't stop. Picking up cigarette butts from the floor, rolling them up, um, going and there used to be a, an area of our town that was where you know, sort of like the rough area or something. And um, so I used to go down there and take drugs. And this is about the age of 14 or something. Um, and I never thought of it then, but I look, look at children now and I think that's very young. You know, that was a young age. Um, but for me, the addiction just went down really quickly. You know, everything just snowballed really, really quickly. And, um, you know, at that time, I don't remember the food being as much of a problem because, you know, I was just on drugs all the time and um, when I was on those drugs I couldn't eat. Um, so I would not eat and I wouldn't get overweight. Um, but then I, when I came down from the drugs I would binge. So yes, I suppose, you know, it was a problem but I wasn't thinking of it that way. And um, my parents were really worried about me. They um, didn't know what to do, but I think they also didn't want to seek help because they worried I'd be taken away. Because um, everything was a secret, nobody knew about the violence or anything like that. Um, and I remember meeting, sitting down with one of my sister's friends who was religious. She was quite strongly Christian and um, she was an absolutely lovely, lovely woman. She was really, really nice and kind. Um, but her parent, there was problems with her parents as well. And so I completely judged her religion on what was going on with her parents. And I thought, you know, that's what that religion does. And I remember her sitting me down and her saying, you know, how about you try this? You know, how about you try this, you know, um, religion that she was in? And just completely scoffing and, you know, putting her down. And, just thinking, I don't need that, you know, I just don't need what you've got. Even though I could see that both my sisters had tried it and they were serene and they were peaceful. Um, I knew there was something wrong with my life, but I thought it was all the things in my life rather than the addiction and what was going on inside. Um, so things kept changing. I went from one secondary school because I was quite badly bullied. Um, so I moved schools and, um, you know, I thought this will be different. And, uh, you know, just the addiction was still there and it got worse. And, you know, I met those people that did, the, did those things. And I remember there being normal people at that school. I, I had one friend that was normal when I went to the school and she was really lovely and meeting people that drank and took drugs and um, also did crazy things with food 
and I just felt at home with them. And I suddenly just didn't feel at home with my friend, my other friend. And I could see that they would do things like go to after school clubs and have hobbies and things like that. And but I just couldn't imagine doing things like that. I just I just couldn't put myself in that place. Like I couldn't manage to get to school on time, I used to miss the bus all the time, my clothes were dirty, um, you know, my, my clothes stank with cigarettes all the time, I was just a mess, you know, at the age of 15, and I just couldn't pull it together. Um, and I remember I had this one friend who, she used to do this thing where she would eat one bread roll a day, and I had another friend who was bulimic, and I used to look at them and think, oh, I wish I could do that, you know, like just have that and that would be enough. Um, you know, and that's how crazy my thinking was, that I would look at someone who, you know, was throwing up in a really bad way and think, you know, that's what I want. Um, but yeah, my life went on like that and, um, you know, it just got worse really, got worse and worse. And I went to university and I remember then feeling very different because there was lots, lots of people there and there was lots more normal people. And um, I remember so very clearly that people were very good with their money. And I, I met this one girl and she had saved up all this money to go to uni. And she didn't have a loan and all of this stuff. And I was just like, just couldn't understand it. Because I, the money was also bad for me, and I got full loan, got money from my parents, got a credit card, got an overdraft, everything, um, as much as I could get. And because the money was another addiction for me, you know, I just spend it and think I'd feel better, and then feel dirty and disgusting. And just like with the food, just like I would, you know, if I binge on food and that feeling afterwards of disgust. Um, so when I was at uni, I discovered dieting properly. Um, I think somebody told me about a particular diet that you could do where you only ate certain things and you got thin really quickly. And I tried it and it worked. And I thought, this is great. Um, so I used to do it for two days or something before we'd go out drinking and I'd lose all this weight. And then I'd drink and then I'd binge. Um, and it, this went over and over. And then my life was just so unmanageable because I thought I had it together, but the drinking was massive. So I was doing all this dieting. And when I was dieting, I was mad because <laughs> I couldn't have a food. And so anyone get near me, just watch out because <laughs> I was just really aggressive. Um, so. Then I got pregnant when I was at university with my ex-boyfriend um, in my unmanageable life and had an abortion um, and that affected me really badly and I still couldn't see how unmanageable it was and so I carried on and I lied to my lecturers and said the reason I wasn't at my lectures was because of the abortion, which wasn't true, it was because I was drinking all the time. Um, so I kept going, and then in my third year of university, I had another abortion um, when I got pregnant from a complete stranger after going out clubbing. And, um, you know, I remember telling my sister and her just laughing because she was just like, she just couldn't believe it. She was just like, this is ridiculous. And just feeling really offended, you know, and not realizing, you know, look at where you are, Layla, and look at what's happened. And, you know, I remember I met this one man who was lovely and I was completely obsessed with him at the time, who was in AA. And, you know, I remember at the time thinking, why is he telling me this? But he sat down and he got sober and he told me all about his drinking. And he did this thing where he would rip women off, you know, that was his then what he did when he was drinking. And he told me how he used to do that and he didn't do it anymore and his whole story. And he just, this, this thing shone out of him, you know, he just had sobriety really. Um, 
but I still didn't know why he was telling me this. And yeah, so I had my first 12 step over that, but it, you know, it didn't wash. And so then I moved to New Zealand because things were going to be different. You know, so many geographicals, I was always moving, trying to start again, trying to do things differently. And so I moved to New Zealand and got a job in a bar and the drinking was bad and the food was worse as well. Um, I'd got to the point where, you know, it took a lot to get drunk. Um, so I got myself into some real messes and my job asked me to leave um, because I got really drunk and ended up nearly fighting with this girl. Um, so I stopped drinking and I went to AA, but then I thought I could do it on my own. So I had a year after that without AA meetings and the food just got so bad like I was just binging all the time and I had this job in a bakery, this really gourmet bakery in Wellington and um, I, my part of the job was that I would clean the cafe up at the end and I got to take everything home. So I would have this bin bag full of cakes and bread and stuff and um, you know I was like this is great you know um, but then I would take it home and I would binge on it and I felt so disgusting and I remember that the people at the workplace never ate food because they were just completely sick of it and so I would try not to eat the food and I would eat, eat it but then I, would, I wouldn't eat that much but I would take the bin back home and eat that um, and one time I remember putting it in the bin because I was like I just I can't do it, and putting it in the bin and then wanting to take it out again and it was a public bin and feeling like, oh, this is gross, you know. Um, so I didn't know what was going on, it was just all crazy and I was being really horrible to my family. I, what I did was when I went to AA, I blamed them for everything because I know now that I wasn't sober. And so rather than other people who were moving on sober, making amends, you know, making a different life for themselves, I was still addicted to the food. So I was full of resentment. So I blamed them, I thought it was all their fault, but all the things that had happened. But then I'd run out of money and I'd run back to them and ask them for money after I'd been really rude to them. And it was about that time that my, my nan got really sick um, and my mum was really suffering. She was back in England. So they were basically, that's horrible to say, but waiting for her to die. And so my mum was in a really bad way and my uncle was being quite difficult and I was just, couldn't stop thinking about myself. I got to the point where I just, couldn't think of anything else about my, uh, than myself and um, you know I know now that's the disease and my nan died and you know that's one great regret I have to say that I was so horrible um, at that time and I have made amends to my nan for that. Um, so then I thought I'm going to change my life again <laughs> and become a makeup artist because I always had all these different ideas of what I was going to be and I found this course in Christchurch and I'd never been to Christchurch and people I knew had said some quite negative things about it and so I thought I'll take a holiday to Christchurch to see what it's like and so I went, came down here about Christmas time, stopped in uh, Kaikoura um, and it was New Year's Eve, that's right, it was New Year's Eve and I thought, oh, I'll have a lovely time in Kaikoura for New Year's Eve. Bought all this food, went to my motel, I think it was, and just binged on this food. And I was just so sad. And I remember just eating and crying, eating and crying. And I'd meant to go out for a meal, but I just couldn't face it. I couldn't face anyone. And went down, signed up for this course. I was like, right, I'm gone, I'm going to go within a week or something I'd gone 
and <clears throat> to this city that I had no idea about, absolutely nothing. And started doing this makeup course, and I was just obsessed with the food. I just wanted it all the time. And I was saying to someone here the other day, I was doing these makeups on these poor girls, and just thinking about food, you know, and hardly talking to them. You know, I know now that being a, doing makeup or being a hairdresser, you have to be quite good at talking to people. And I just, I just didn't talk to them. I was just, you know. And then I would have a break and I would binge on this food and then it was awful. I've had to make amends to those girls. And I started going back to AA because I realised I just, this is just awful. And I asked someone to be my sponsor in AA, who's in this room at the time. And I remember sitting down with her with lunch and she was telling me her story. And I had my lunch and a piece of chocolate cake. And she was telling me her story, and because she came here, I had stuff about food. And she talked about going to an all-you-can-eat buffet and just eating all the stuff, you know. And I was like, oh my gosh, she knows. She knows what I'm like, you know. The chocolate cake was like, you know, in my mind it was like massive, you know. <laughs> it was the focal thing on my lap. And... I, you know, she, I think she talked not long after that about going to a, a meeting, uh, you know, for food addiction. And I went to that meeting, it was in Latimer Square, and people were talking about their husbands and things that happened, and not really talking about food, but they were just so calm and relaxed and happy. I just couldn't, I was just blown away, completely blown away. And my heart was racing, like you wouldn't believe, and my face was aching from pretending everything was all right, and it was just awful, and I, I was living in this flat where I was eating my flatmate's kids' food, because I'd eaten all my own food, um, and I was still pretending that everything was okay, but here was a place that people talked about, eating frozen food and vomiting and other addictions as well, you know, that that they had. So it was amazing, it was really amazing. And even though I thought I wasn't as bad, I kept coming. And I've kept coming to this day. Um, you know, I've never had a big break from meetings, even when I might have been a bit mental. <laughs> um, because there's nowhere else. There's nowhere else for me. And I never imagined I would be coming to a fellowship for food addiction. Um, you know, there was a point that I thought, yeah, the drugs are bad, and I decided I would stop when I moved to New Zealand, but, you know, the food, I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have identified. Um, and I was really ashamed, and I didn't believe I was as bad, so I did do more eating, and, um, you know, for me, it did take a while to get completely sober and, you know, surrender to this program, but I kept coming, and, you know, I remember people talked about praying, getting on their knees, and I was like, oh my gosh, I spent my life, you know, trying to, trying to prove there's no God, you know, um, so, and I was so embarrassed, and I thought, what if people from home will find out, because I really went on about it, I was awful, but I didn't know what else to do, and so I found myself praying, and um, especially after I picked up the first time, it was terrifying. Um, you know, and something happened. You know, I remember being on a food plan at the beginning. If I'm not going over, tell me if I go over. Um, and I remember being on a food plan at that time and not eating, and it was just amazing. It was like better than any drug I'd ever had. <laughs> You know, I remember lying in my bed and just feeling really clean. Um, yeah, it was amazing. Um, so, yeah, um, I've kept coming and, you know, my family know that I come here and they know that this is what's most important in my life. And I think even though it's taken them a long while to accept it, they're grateful, they are grateful that, um, it's not like it was because it was pretty horrible. 
Um, and I remember when I came here and telling my mum, and she said to me, you know, Lola, we never knew what we were going to get. Um, you know, one minute you were happy and then you were sad and they never knew and I always hid it. You know, I remember when I felt sad and I would go up to my room and I would cry into my pillow so that nobody could hear. And I was on the third floor, <laughs> like no one was going to hear. Um, and I used to self-harm, that was a big other thing for me because um, I couldn't talk to people about how I really felt inside. Um, and my parents were really worried about that. Um, but it's all got better. It's all got better and I've been able to become a grown-up. And in the last few years I've learned to drive. Um, I've been in my job for, I've been in my organisation for almost six years, which is an absolute miracle because I always laugh when things got bad. Um, and when things are bad, I say sorry. I even try and say sorry too much. <laughs> I tell my sponsor and she says, Lola. Because, <laughs> you know, I just, yeah, I'm terrified of, you know, going back into those resentments. But it's better. And, you know, I'm so grateful for all the people here because I do feel like it's not just God and the steps and you know, all of that, my sponsor is the people here as well that have looked after me when I've had nothing. So I'll keep coming. Thank you.